Hello. So, um, as just mentioned, my name is Brian Arnold. I'm a senior software engineer at Bizarre Voice. Uh, if you'd like to be an engineer at Bizarre Voice too, let me know later. Uh, we're hiring like crazy. Uh, in my prior life, I worked for a company called SitePin, where I became a dojo committer. And I basically spent a few years of my life digging through and fixing other people's code. And so there are a number of insights and techniques I picked up over the time that have turned into what this talk is now. So there's kind of three sections, uh, a couple things that are just useful that are not necessarily technical, but useful to think about, uh, some diving through the tools a little bit, and then I'll show you how I abuse those tools for profit. So uh, some non-technical tips. I think it's really important to emphasize that you need to be open to learning. Uh, we have a lot of people in this field, they think they know what they're doing, maybe they do, but they're not open to learning new things or being accepting to other ideas. Uh, you don't know how to build something until you've built it. Likewise, you don't know how to fix a bug until you've fixed it. Uh, so one of the biggest things is I think that people need to actually take time to learn the language. Uh, don't just pick up the good parts and call it a day. Uh, invest some time in the definitive guide or read the spec or just something beyond just some really simple basics. Additionally, uh, you should learn about dev tools. That's part of what this talk is. But also at the end of this, there's going to be a link to a website called Discover Dev Tools. It's a thing that uh, Google has put together in conjunction with a group called Code School. Uh, it's probably the most worthwhile 45 minutes of your time that you'll invest in the next few weeks if you haven't done it already. Uh, so take some time to learn how to use the tools. Uh, I, just, I can't emphasize that enough. I talk to people that they don't understand that you can do more than just simple console logging, which is better than alert debugging, but not by much. Uh, how many people have heard of this rubber duck concept? Uh, not a lot. So the idea of the rubber duck is that you have somebody or something that you can bounce ideas off of. Sometimes by translating a problem from the code and data structures in your mind into actual words, uh, into English that you're speaking to each other or whatever language you choose, uh, it winds up helping you gain some greater insight in, into what the problem is and how to fix it. Uh, I commonly talk to people at my office. We'll just sit down for a while and we'll talk about things. Uh, sometimes I describe things to a stuffed cat that I keep on my desk. Just the process of actually verbalizing it and trying to explain it to another entity gives you greater insight, much more than you would think. So. Uh, that being said, those are just a couple things that are useful up front, uh, but I really want to dig through the tools. Uh, one of the biggest tools that we have is the command line API. Uh, there's the command in the console. Uh, this is something that was popularized by Firebug. Uh, if you were in the industry back when Firebug first came out, like, you know, gosh, what's that been, eight, ten years? It was amazing. You didn't have to use alerts anymore and you didn't have to freeze everything and you could log things out. Uh, well, there's a lot more to the command line API than what people typically use. So uh, to demonstrate a couple of things, here I've got a standard to-do MVC app. This is very specifically the backbone implementation using an AMD uh, required JS setup. Uh, I expect a lot of people in this room have probably seen something like this before. Well, the first thing I want to do is I'm going to inspect an element. And I'm actually going to do that using a keyboard shortcut. In this case on the Mac, it's Command-Shift-C. I think it's Control-Shift-C. It actually puts me into inspect mode right away. That actually tends to be how I open the console. I don't right click to inspect anymore. It's just nicer to use a keyboard shortcut. So here I am. I've, I'm on an element. I'm on this label. This is great. But if I want to work with this in the command line, how do I identify this specific element that I have? There, there's not an ID on it, it's just a label. If I actually want to work with this thing, uh, I've seen people do ugly stuff like they'll apply a funky class to it or they'll set an ID on it, something like that. It turns out that within the console, you have this $0 variable. $0 happens to be a reference to the last item that was inspected. Ta-da, that's really nice. Uh, you can then work with that. And you can go the other way too. So you can actually say, I'm going to inspect $0. That actually would move you back to the inspector if I weren't on it. Let me, there you go. So with inspect in the command line API, which is not on the console object, it's just a command that's supported as a part of the command line, that allows you to say, I have a DOM node reference and I want to move back to it in the inspector. Uh, so you might be in your sources, you might be paused somewhere. Uh, you might want to inspect, in this case, I'm going to inspect 0.parent node 
or well, I guess parent element probably should work too. So now I'm on the div that was its parent. Since I've now highlighted that, that div is now dollar zero. And in fact, I have the previous one in dollar one. So there's actually several dollar number variables. That the quantity of them depends on the environment that you're working in, uh, but they're really kind of useful to be able to move back and forth between your element inspection and your command line. Uh, pretty useful, just quick little navigation. Oh, and then there's also, oh, where did my fonts go? That's lovely. Uh, there's this dollar underscore variable. Uh, we'll, we'll play with that in more detail later, but dollar underscore is the last thing that the console evaluated to. So I might be doing something like if I, if I take the window object and I hit dot, I get this nice big autocomplete series, right? And I can kind of start exploring and looking at different properties. But let's say I wanted to look at all the divs and I hit dot and I don't get any autocomplete because this is a jQuery call. It's a function invocation. It doesn't know what it's going to return, so it can't give me a meaningful uh, expansion. But if I just execute it, well, now dollar underscore is the same thing as what I just got back. So now I can hit dot and start to actually look through the different attributes, uh, the different properties and methods, rather, that exist on this object. Uh, it, it can be kind of problematic because if you, if you do something else, it automatically overwrites dollar underscore, uh, but that's okay. Uh, one thing that I've used this to great effect for in the past is I'll pick an element and I just want to quickly, I'm going to clear the console real quick. I just want to quickly uh, show all of my parent. So I'll say dollar zero once and then parent node and then I'll execute that a few times and eventually I get back up to the body because each time I'm executing it, it's changing what dollar underscore means. So just kind of a neat way to explore and work with different elements in the command line. Oh, wrong button there. There we go. Uh, there are also some other ways to use uh, the console object as well as different commands that exist in order to inspect things to a greater detail. So back here, uh, you know, we've all seen console.log but there's really a ton of different options that exist in the console. Uh, for example, Dave talked about console.time. Uh, there's time and time end. There's this uh, timeline if you want to start timelines as well. Uh, there's variations on logs. So you can do console.warn, for example, if you want to make sure it shows up a little differently. There's console.trace that you can execute in your code if you want to dump a stack trace at that point without having to throw an error and get the stack out of that. Uh, in particular, one I'm a big fan of is group. Uh, what group does when you execute that is it will actually, uh, it creates a little folding group and now all the different, uh, all the different things that I log out exist under that group and then when I close that group, now it's actually a nice little expando that I have some level of control over and I'm going to show you a trick that I use with that in the next one to actually get an interactive layered sort of stack trace uh, which is kind of cool. Uh, so console has a ton of different things. Uh, I've got some links at the end of my deck and you'll be able to grab my deck later uh, that point to the command line and the console API for both Chrome and Firebug. Uh, Firefox natively does support some of these things too, but support's kind of varied. You really have to uh, look around and see what's there. Oh, and then there's dir. So I'm going to take $0 again. This is my DOM node. This DOM node has properties and I can expand them out if I type dot and I kind of start exploring autocomplete, but if I want to actually treat it like I would normally see an object, I can execute this dir command. And when I do that, you'll notice it's still the label now, but now I can expand it as though I just logged out an object. Uh, in this case, I'm just getting the JavaScript object representation rather than the DOM node. There's also a thing that you can do that can be really useful for copying objects. So. I'm shifting over. This is a test page that we use at Bizarre Voice. Uh, we collect ratings and reviews. And this is just an environment I went into because it has this object. I'm going to grab this internal piece of configuration. I want to copy this out into a text editor. Let's say I'm, I'm trying to get, I just want to look through the object in a little bit greater detail. If I were to do something, there's actually this copy command in the command, in the command line API. And so I can copy that and go into Sublime and then I get object object which didn't really mean anything to me. Uh, I got the two string representation. Well, 
I can use json.stringify to create the stringified version. Uh, that's kind of ugly. I don't want that. I'm going to use a couple of extra arguments to make it uh, pretty print that a little bit better. So json.stringify, uh, the second argument is a transform. You can use that to filter specific keys out, but I, typically most people just drop a null because you want the whole object. You specify your indent, and there you go. And that's looking like I want, so I'm going to copy the dollar underscore since that was my last evaluation. And now I can take that into a text editor and I've got this nice JSON string, uh, easily mutated, easily searched through. Uh, in fact, I was looking at porting my blog over to Harp, which is an interesting system. There's a conversion thing from Jackal and it dumped a big object out. Uh, I actually took the object into Chrome, mutated it, and used this technique to copy it back out so that way I'm not hand editing my JSON. So, you know, kind of some useful tricks, some neat little stuff with that. There's also uh, breakpoints, which I assume a lot of people in this room probably have some familiarity with. Uh, in different discussions with people, a lot of people don't actually seem to know about debugger. How many people have seen the debugger statement? Okay, this is actually pretty good coverage for that. Uh, it's a programmatic breakpoint. I'm not going to belabor that point too much. Uh, but a lot of things that, that are worth looking at here I've got in my sources. I've set a couple of breakpoints. I'm not using a debugger. Uh, we also have the watch expressions, which not a lot of people seem to use. Uh, if you haven't used watches before, it's kind of up here in the upper right. Uh, you can basically put in any expression that you want and watch it change as your code executes. So you can be stepping through things. It'll automatically evaluate on every step. If for some reason it doesn't seem to be working right, you can even hit this little refresh button. Uh, you can expand out and see all the different variables that are available in, the, in that scope to you as well. Uh, being comfortable developing some comfort in breakpoints is really useful. Uh, I want to show, for example, here, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to mutate this list item. Uh, let's say we'll do that. So now I've got a breakpoint here, and this is freezing uh, at this filter. Uh, I could make this a conditional breakpoint if I wanted. Perhaps I only, let's see what to do is. Uh, actually, that's not going to give me what to do is right now. Let's look in my, not in my list, I'm going to look in my, my variables. So here is this, which is child. I can kind of expand this out. Uh, maybe I only want to break when listener ID is 12, or there may be some other more meaningful attribute. If I right click on a breakpoint, I get this edit option. And if I go into edit, this allows me to type in any expression that I want. And if that expression evaluates to true, it'll stop there. Uh, so c having these conditional breakpoints is incredibly useful, especially if you're trying to put a break in the middle of a loop, and if that loop's executing a thousand times, it really stinks to sit there and hit F8 until you get the right condition that you want. Uh, so being able to put in a, an expression that maybe says this dot uh, listener ID uh, not dashes 12, and that would only break on that specific condition, and it even co changes color to help you see that that's what's going on. Uh, one recent addition to Chrome that's kind of cool, I could sit here and hit play a whole bunch of times, or I could disable breakpoints, but there's actually now a press and hold action. So when I press and hold, I can then move down, and this basically just stops pausing for half a second. So it kind of lets me get off the stack and get out of the way without having disabled or turned off breakpoints or anything like that. It's just a nice quick little way to say I'm done debugging now, but I'm going to be going to debug again here in a moment. So I'll come back in. This time it didn't hit because the listener ID was different. It caught in this other spot. And then I can just go ahead and skip past that. So using your debugger very effectively, getting comfortable using breakpoints, uh, using conditional breakpoints, there's some cool ways you can abuse those that I'm going to show here in a moment. Uh, there are other types of breakpoints, though, that people don't always necessarily know about. You can set DOM breakpoints and you can set XHR breakpoints as well. So for one of these, for example, I'm going to go to just GitHub, open my dev tools, and I'm going to come over here. For some reason it's best seen in, wait, right, not elements, sources. Here we go. Uh, so we have DOM breakpoints and XHR breakpoints. So when you set an XHR breakpoint, you're basically creating uh, regex that gets ran against your URL to say, should I break if this request is made? 
If you leave it empty, you'll notice it actually has a breakpoint listed there now that says any XHR request, I want to break on that. So here I can reload the page and now you'll notice that I'm broken on GitHub's deploy. Uh, and I'm in the middle of this one giant, long, horrible function that I can't figure out looking at this visually. Another button that's worth looking at when you're trying to do stuff like this and you're working in a production environment is this pretty print thing that I've highlighted over here down in the corner. Uh, pretty print basically takes whatever code it's looking at. Oh, I think I double clicked it. There we go. And it completely reformats and relays it out. It's still minified. You, you still have to figure out what O means, but it's, it's now much more easy to read, uh, which is really quite nice. And so here I can see this is very specifically where I'm broken. This was the send. And so I can actually inspect at this point and see what got sent. Uh, did this t.data get sent? Yeah, it looks like that's probably what's getting sent up. And, and you, can, you can start digging around. Being able to break on XHR is really nice. If you have a specific RESTful endpoint that you're trying to intercept all requests to, for example, well, those meet regular expression patterns pretty nicely. Uh, you also have this concept of DOM breakpoints. And so over here, uh, we have our DOM structure where we had our list item. I'm going to re-inspect this node to get back there. Here we go. So I can actually, I can go up here on this unordered list. Uh, I can right click on it and I can break on, let's say, subtree modifications. Now that if I look in sources, I now have a DOM breakpoint for subtree mods. And if I change that, uh, it's hitting these breakpoints. Let me disable that breakpoint really quick. Uh, kill those. Now you can see that I'm broken where it was actually modifying the subtree. And I can see what the original inner HTML was and what it is or what it's trying to set it to. So here you can see give talk with a bunch of K's in it, which is because that's what I typed. Here was the original version that had just a single K in give talk. It's really nice to be able to see when something is being changed. That being said, you kind of have to be careful uh, when, when you're setting these. When I set this, I set this on the unordered list. And you'll notice if I look back in sources, the property that's being overwritten is this div that has a class of view, which happens to map to this element. So if I had actually set the DOM breakpoint on this element for subtree modifications, it would not have been hit because this subtree wasn't being modified. It was being destroyed. So typically, uh, you want to, you, you, you ha it feels a little more hit or miss with some of the DOM breakpoints because you have to find the right spot in the DOM to insert them. But they're, they're really useful if you're trying to track down, uh, for some reason I'm getting weird extra DOM structures, I don't know where they're coming from. This is a great way to find those. Or if something's just not acting the way you would expect and you're getting weird structures, you can break on subtree mods and figure out what's going on. Uh, I had some code once that was changing a class on a list item but there was another event listener higher up in the chain that was running the same exact code, so it, the net result was I wouldn't see my change happening. And by using subtree modifications, I was able to detect the second execution, if that makes sense. Uh, also, in this source tab, uh, there's, I already showed the, printy, the pretty print feature, which is really nice. Uh, there is this fuzzy finder as well, uh, which is nice. You can hit Command O. And when you start typing, it does a, a fuzzy match. So I don't have to necessarily know what I'm looking for. I can type 2JS. And you'll notice that in the list, it's matching a whole bunch of different things and it's, it's bolding the pieces of the string that match. If you're used to fuzzy finding from like Sublime or TextMate or you've got Control-P installed in your Vim, uh, it's kind of nice to have that here as well. And you don't have to type long, giant, horrible paths to everything. Uh, additionally, in Chrome, they recently reorganized all of this. So there's this button up here now, which is a control over when your tool breaks on its own without you explicitly setting a point. Uh, by default, it is black, which means that it pauses on nothing. If you click it once, it's going to go blue and it will pause on every single exception, even if they're caught. And that's generally not what you want unless you're actually trying to debug something like jQuery where it's intentionally catching and suppressing errors. If you load a page with this set, you will probably hit several different breaks that are not actually broken. It's just that it detected an exception. 
One more click turns it this kind of dark red color, and that's when it'll break on uncaught exceptions. If it bubbled all the way up, this will pause at that point. So this is incredibly useful to turn on if you're getting just a random console error, you don't know where or why. Just turn this on, hit reload, and see what happens. And then from there, you'll be, you'll be able to start digging through the call stack here and doing all sorts of different work. Uh, it is worth noting too that when you're, when you're in the call stack and you work in the console, the context of the console changes. So right now I'm in this anonymous, whoops, I'm in this anonymous function in jQuery. So this is equal to the jQuery collection. If I come back over here into this level and I run the same command, I'm just checking this. Well, now it's the context and backbone. So being able to use the call stack to select an area that you're working in and then going into the command line and exploring inside of that context is, is really useful and quite powerful. So let's see. Oh, uh, there's profiling as well. Uh, Dave actually covered a lot of that to some kind of nice depth. I'm not going to dive a whole lot into that. Uh, I hadn't planned on it anyway, but he was a part of that, or it was a part of his talk, which is pretty great. Uh, if you go on to Discover DevTools, it gives a much greater in-depth coverage of profiling than I could ever choose to uh, in a 30-minute talk. But it's definitely something that's worth investing a little bit of your time in. So with the time that I have left, I want to talk about some techniques. Uh, I really cannot emphasize how important it is that you write your code to use a style guide. And that sounds like a weird thing to say for debugging, right? But I can tell you from experience that when you dive into a JavaScript file that is 68,000 lines of code that's written without a style guide, it is absolutely horrible and painful. You will save yourself so much time and effort if you write your code consistently and cleanly. Uh, there's things like idiomatic, which is a great baseline if your team doesn't already have a style guide. Uh, there's also this editor config tool, which it doesn't do a ton, but it helps ensure that spaces versus tabs isn't a, a holy war as much anymore, uh, and new lines at the end of files and all these things. It, I cannot tell you enough how important it is to make sure your code is consistent and clean. That's the best technique uh, I could give anybody for making sure they can fix their code is that it was written cleanly. Uh, when I joined the team at Bizarre Voice, it was written with a really nice style guide and I was able to dive right in and, and feel very comfortable fixing things. You should use private mode when you're working on things. Uh, there are a lot of things that people do, like they'll install 17 different uh, Chrome extensions. I mean, myself, I've already got, you know, Tamper Monkey, Web Developer, Chromecast, LastPass. Uh, those actually start impacting the tools because you see them show up in your network stack and you see them show up uh, in, in other areas of inspection because they are code that's executing on the page. So if you just hit the keystroke to get straight into a private browser, well now you're browsing in an environment that has no cache, no cookies, no local storage. It is pristine, clear, clean every time, which is pretty great for debugging because that ensures that any session data, anything you have lingering, it's not there anymore. Uh, you may be missing some different tools that you might use as extensions, but you can go in and tell extensions they have access to private mode and then you're fine. There are times, though, that private mode isn't enough. And this tip is, is more Chrome specific. Private mode works pretty much everywhere. Uh, you'll notice in my Chrome, I've got this little blue icon in the top. Uh, I actually run multiple users. So I've got my user for my personal stuff with my bookmarks. I have a second user that I use specifically when I'm doing things for work. And what's nice about that is that different user profiles have different cookies, different settings, different extensions. Uh, so there's a number of different work specific extensions that I use and they're encapsulated under this separate profile. And I can tell which profile I'm in because I have a different icon. Uh, additionally, this means that you can have them configured with different settings. Uh, it's easier to test different environments this way. Uh, in fact, I, I would even go so far as to say it's, it's just useful to spin up new users Often, if, if you're debugging something beyond a single session, but you want something akin to private mode, just create a new user. Uh, here, I'll, I'll make one right now. Here's a user. Uh, a couple things I do when I make a new user that I think are really important. Open your dev tools. If you hit a question, actually not on this tab, any other tab, if you hit question mark, it opens these settings. Uh, in the settings, disabling the cache, you probably want to come in here and turn this on. Uh, if, you're, if you're leaving your cache on and you're trying to debug things, you'll very frequently get old code and that's not useful. 
Uh, you can also turn on experiments. I like turning on the step in candidates while debugging. Uh, I'll show you what that looks like as well as the framework uh, debugging support. So those are a couple things I turn on to, to show them in action. Uh, where, here we go. So here, when I had these breakpoints on earlier, I actually had step in candidates showing. So I will come back and use the half, oh, there's not enough to get out. I'm not clicking that well. Ah, whatever, I will do that instead. There we go. So I'm gonna come back, I'm gonna modify this. Now you'll notice uh, here I'm on a break and there are two different things that I could step into. Uh, I could either wind up stepping into this apply or I could wind up stepping into this call for completed. Now in this case completed would be the first one so it's bold uh, but this actually gives you step in candidates that are clickable to step into what that function's doing which is kind of cool. Uh, the other thing that I think uh, is really worth pointing out with this, uh, with this framework debugging support when that's on, that allows me to come in, well, one thing I want to point out, all of my third party code in this case lives in this Bower components directory, all of my code lives here. So if I'm at this completed point and I step into this filter, well now I'm stepping into backbone and I step and I step and I step and I step and eventually I get to the next line in my code which is really what I wanted originally. If I have on this external debugging support, I can now come into, sorry, into general here and there's a checkbox that says to skip stepping through sources with particular names. So now I'm going to filter out Bower. The next time I hit that breakpoint, oh, uh, all these DOM mods, let me turn that off. The next time I hit that breakpoint and I step in, I go straight to the next line of code because it skipped past all of the backbone stuff since that was in a directory named Bower. So that is incredibly useful if you don't want to be stepping through a bunch of jQuery backbone underscore what have you. Uh, you can kind of black box them and say I don't really care about that implementation. I just want to stick to my code. Incredibly useful. This was something that Dave talked about. I tweeted saying stop stealing my points. Uh, I wrote this, this blog post article about a year and a half ago when I figured this out. Uh, if you come in here and you just want to see how often this is being executed but you don't actually want to change the code, you can put in a console statement as what gets evaluated as your breakpoint. What will happen is this will get executed and as long as it returns true it will break but it definitely gets evaluated. So now if I open up the console I can hit, I will resume, I'll turn that checkpoint back on. I'll make this change again here and you'll notice that now I got this completed call showing up down here and as I let it keep going it's going to keep firing. I should really turn off that DOM breakpoint. That thing is slowing me down. So that is, is a really useful way of just kind of inserting some simple stuff into execution without having to redeploy. If you're working in a production environment where your code is minified and you, it takes you 10 minutes to do a build or a deploy or you can't because uh, you don't want to mess up your client's implementation or whatever, uh, being able to kind of inject extra little bits of code like this to inspect and debug is really powerful. In fact, I used it here. You can't really see it terribly well. Uh, I wanted to test a fix. So I found the minified code, I made a minified version of it and I executed it before the original line executed through a conditional breakpoint in order to actually test it without having to do a full build and redeploy. And in this case it turned out it worked really well. I went in and made the actual code change and tested it and it worked just fine. Uh, one, other th one last thing I wanted to show you, this thing has been invaluable for watching stacks execute. What this piece of code is doing is it's taking an object, it's saying give me all the methods that exist on this object and it's completely replacing each one of them with code that starts a group, logs out the arguments, executes the original in the correct context with the correct arguments, shows you what the return value was and closes the group. What that looks like is here, uh, I'm going to click into this and you'll notice I've got something that shows me what the current active element is. I will hit tab. And now I can see that all of this code executed when I hit tab and I get this nice kind of stair stepped visual showing me each function invocation, what the arguments were and what the return values were. Which is kind of cool.
Thanks.